You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbor, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you read only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Now, Lord, as we um, study your word, your revelation, uh, you making known the, the, your kingdom principles, as Pastor J.C. said, it's an upside-down kingdom. It's different than how we automatically function. And so, Lord, as we, as we let your word be a mirror to us, I pray that your spirit would move, that you would remind us of the sufficiency of Christ, uh, but you'd also help us to become con conformed more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So, if you were to summarize this whole thing in one move, it would be, be known for love. He, Jesus, and, and he's come, as you've seen in the, the Sermon of the Mount, what he's done, he's kind of like a new Moses. He set all these things out, and they're almost like counterintuitive to what we think the blessed life would be. When I, you know, if I ask everyone, hey, what's the blessed life? Well, we talked about no one, no one normally in their flesh would just automatically say the kinds of things that, that Jesus says, this is the blessed life. So it's, he's looking from eternity. And in the middle of this, he's been shaping. He's been teaching some things that, that are hard on the earth because we're so not like him. But six surprising family expectations. Here, let me just tell you them quickly, and then I'll come and we'll talk about what that means. Meekness, grace, service, generosity, love, and prayer. Meekness, grace, service, generosity, love, and prayer. Now, that sounds, that sounds simple, doesn't it? Uh, but the, God's word is like a mirror. And when you look into it, Rarely do you look great without Jesus, actually. So known for love, if you were to, to, to identify kind of, I think it's summary of what Jesus has called his people to be like, it's to be known for love. Uh, look at verses 38 through 39 again. Meekness for offense. Meekness for offense. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turned him the other also. Have you ever wondered what in the world that is talking about? I've had people ask me at, at, at George Mason, I, would, I used to go up there, and uh, people would say, well, what does this mean? What, what exactly does this mean? Uh, Jesus is talking to his people. This is the key thing. Uh, he's talking to individuals who are supposed to represent the kingdom of God on earth, and he says something that is kind of not natural to us. Our general thought is someone slaps me. I mean, I'm telling you, believers say this, by the way. Uh, he slapped me, I'm slapping him back. Like that literally will be, that comes out of the mouth. Believers in normal conversations because it's so automatic to how we think. Now what Jesus says, I mean, so the key thing here, the first thing to be known is meekness for offense. Meekness is the, is the key word. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. So what Jesus is doing is he is setting himself apart from all other leaders. Uh, other people reference and quote other people. Jesus is saying, I say to you. He's going against kind of the common discussion in Jewish theological circles of expectations of what one should do or not do. Now, the key thing to know here is this is, is a slap. This is really more like an offensive slap, the kind of thing that would make you mad, uh, but it's not, um, uh, well, it's, it's rude. In every category, there's nothing nice about what's happening here. But Jesus kind of sets himself apart. He's talking to these individuals, and he says, you've heard it was said, but I say to you. He's exposing the, the bent use of the law in the past. What was happening is the Jewish leadership were kind of, if there was a, someone's called this the line of Scripture, the line of Scripture. Everyone say the line of Scripture. All right, so this isn't mine, but I like it. The, the idea that if you go beneath the line of Scripture, you're saying you're, you're lowering it. But if you go beyond the line of Scripture, then you're saying more than it says. And what, what the Jewish leadership were doing, they were adding to in one way. They're adding all these new things that you needed to do to guarantee that you didn't break the law. 
But they weren't doing the bare minimum in a sense because they didn't do it from their heart. They were looking for what, what can I get by with? If you're looking for the bare minimum, you're not looking for the heart of the law. It isn't about love. Can you all hear me? I feel like I'm circling. and I could wait a moment if we're doing that, but I just, we're good? I might keep talking. I'm, not, I'm fine. I'm comfortable. So, but I just thought maybe things were happening. All right, whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All right, so here thing is this. So you, Jesus is, again, distinguishing his, his authority from the, the, what's the kind of going oral tradition. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye. Now think about it. You've heard of this. An eye for an eye, a tooth for the tooth. Is this the first time anyone's ever heard this today? Okay, right? And you kind of make sense. Well, let me tell you what was kind of going on is you're looking for justice, actually, that if a person were to harm you, this was actually more for a civil view of justice, that if a person, if you accidentally, let's say it like that, harm someone, that instead of you being, like let's say you ran over someone's foot, right? Instead of someone killing you, you would say, hey, you ran over your foot. That's all that's required. Right? So it's actually really an effort to flatten uh, abrasive responses. Someone crosses your driveway, and, and you're in my land, and so I take your life. You're like, no, no, you cross my driveway. There's a di-. Like, so the eye for an eye, the tooth for was done righteously, was really meant to flatten and to keep justice intact. But was, it's kind of playing out where there's this expectation. The heart of what's going on has now been dismissed. Jesus says with authority, but I say to you, to his disciples, who he's shaping, his kingdom people, he's saying this, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. What are you even asking? Someone slaps you on the right cheek, give him the other also. I think I need to qualify some important things. So, this is not about self-defense. This is not someone's harming your family. This is not um, anything like that. It's saying that retaliation is unacceptable. Personal retaliation is unacceptable for the people of God. Does that make sense to you? That you can't just come at all that you have. In fact, you're supposed to surrender and take a loss sometimes. Now, the key, one, one reason we know this isn't about self-defense, this is about the military, is there are other places. John the Baptist, uh, soldiers, all right, actual soldiers come to him. And that would have been a great time for you to say, you need to lay down your weapons and, and go quit being a, an officer. And that's not what he says. He says soldiers are not to extort. So he doesn't say, hey, quit being in the military. This, he's not, Jesus is not a pacifist. And I can, I'm not going to go real far into that lane, but I have a lot to say on it. Uh, the short summary is this is about personal offense. It's not, you're not to retaliate for personal offense. This is an insult in the highest order you've been slapped. And what you want to do in your flesh when someone strikes you in the cheek is to slap them right back. And that's exactly exact what Jesus says, this is not for us. Uh, he, is, he is meek. And Jesus is like this. You need to be known for love, and love exceeds the bare minimum. All right? Love exceeds the bare minimum. So you think about Matthew uh, 26, 62 through 70. Uh, the high priest, this is at the end, Jesus is, is going to be crucified. Okay? Um, the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? And I'm really glad Jesus made no answer because by him staying in the middle of this, he paid for my sins and yours. And I said, what is this that these men testify against you? They're accusing him of various things, uh, but Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, you have said so. But then he says some words that make war in the building. He says, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? Wait for it. Uh, you have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. And then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him. Uh, Jesus lived this. Now, what you need to know is the same one they're slapping upholds their existence, actually. So meekness is, is, has nothing to do with strength. In fact, it takes, you, it takes a lot more strength to be meek. To take a slap and to do nothing, it takes a lot more strength than to return fire. It just does. I'm reminded of a pastor, Catherine, I went to a conference one time, uh, and, and this guy became a believer. He was in special forces or something in the military, and he trained uh, in physical combat. Well, he was witnessing 
with his friend, a deacon with him, uh, and they went to a local, I guess a bar or something. I, don't, I wasn't there with him. Uh, and he, he goes and he's, he's talking and to maybe at the, at the entrance, and the bouncer does not receive him warmly. He punches him in the face. As I recall, it bloodies his face. Uh, and the deacon with him said, hit him, pastor, hit him. Like that's literally what was said. Like he's like, you're already mad. But here's what, the, what was interesting. This guy telling the story said this. He goes, I wept or something like this. And the reason was I wanted to kill him. Like in his flesh, everything in his being said, you don't know who I am. A pastor <laughs> been punched in the face. His flesh said, end him now. And he could have. And, and the Spirit of God convicted him. And he just grieved because he knew this guy's an image bearer, blind as a bat, cannot see what's going on. The good news of the gospel is standing in front of him. The guy punches him in the face. And this pastor it was admitting, he's like, I, I just grieved because I was so tempted. I was so tempted to hurt him. And what Jesus is saying, meekness, that his people are called to meekness. That your flesh wants to, to rage and wants to do anything. And the people of God are called to surrender. Again, this is not about self-defense. It's actually an act of love, just side note quickly, to protect defenseless people. And sometimes with physical force, to be honest with you. Germany, the, Hitler didn't stop because he, he wanted to. People stopped him. That's how this works. So just quick side note. Revelation talks about Jesus coming and war being a part of his conversation. So he's not a pacifist, but for private offense, he has called his people to be meek. And your flesh is, is really proud. And he's called us to be known for love. And love exceeds what's the bare minimum. The bare minimum would have been like not killing him. <laughs> I just beat him real bad. I taught him a lesson so I could teach him the gospel later. That, that would never work for that guy, right? But, but stronger... Was, was love, that he, he didn't reply when he was offended. Jesus kept quiet under trial in a place that he could have absolutely, he could have absolutely defended himself. He did not. Second point, surprising family expectations. His grace in loss. Look at verse 40 now. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Now, we're used to clothes. We probably have access. doesn't matter where you are. You have probably some access to clothes. Well, this is a time where clothes were not that readily available. And actually, your tunic was abnormally needed for survival. You'd be double as a blanket and lots of things. And there were actual rights in the Old Testament associated with the tunic. So we're like, tunic, who cares? Take your tunic. You know, that's how we think about it. But this was like, this is like, I don't have many of these. I have one, you know, and this is how I'm going to stay warm through the winter. So the idea here is Jesus says, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have the cloak also. So based on the fact that lawsuits were not like they are here, where everyone's doing lawsuits, uh, the, it would have been very likely that you, you had earned the right to lose your tunic. So probably the lawsuit was going to go through. And it's in this context that Jesus actually calls his people to exceed legal expectations. You deserve to lose your tunic. He's like, give him more. And this picture is, is that you are known and marked by love. That Reconciliation is such a high priority for the people of God that there are places that you take a loss, that you go beyond expectations. So grace and loss, that you're known for love. So second one is grace. First one, meekness for personal offense. Second is grace and loss. I look at the third one. Uh, known for, for service and audacity. Let me translate audacity. And that you are outraged. Look what he says. If one forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, can you imagine being compelled to carry some, some military man's backpack for a mile? And in the context, it was appropriate. It was actually expected that, that they could do this rightly. And you can think even in American history, when British people came to the, you know, like they could like, to house them. <laughs> you're... You're American, you have this like, you don't tell me what I'm doing, ever. But anyways, in this context, Rome had the right legally to say, you're going to carry the backpack. Think of Simon of Cyrene, you know? In the end of, of, of kind of the gospel, 
where Jesus' cross is too much for him. He can't even physically carry it. The Roman says to Simon of Cyrene, carry the cross. And what you don't see is him saying, I don't have to, I'm legally not obliged to do that. There's a sense of like he was compelled to actually help. All right, so that's kind of what's going on here. So service and audacity, as I think about it, is you've, you've been so rude as to actually use your ability that you've actually asked me to carry your stuff. I cannot believe you would do that. Who would do that? Well, this is the idea. If anyone forces you to go, go one mile, go with him too. What would Jesus do? He would go with him too. Now, what he is not saying is that the new legalism is that when someone asks you to go one mile, that on two miles and one step, that you drop his junk. That is not what's going on. These are principles. He's actually not chosen every conceivable principles. He's showing us what the people of God are supposed to be known for, and it's love at the end of the day. I can tell you this. If I'm loving someone, I don't draw lines like that. I don't look for bare minimums. I don't look for, for loopholes. What, what, what is the smallest amount of thing I could do to actually, that Catherine would be modestly pleased with me? You know, like, love doesn't do that. Love done rightly is looking for more. Like, there's no line. You're not looking for bare minimum. You're looking to love, right? So I think that's, again, why I think known for love is a good way to think about it. But service and audacity, he actually says this. If anyone does Jesus to his people, which means you, if you belong to him, all right? Someone asks you outrageously to, to help. And in that context, transfer it to ours. Something that's just not that convenient to you. You don't really want to do it. I doubt anyone wanted to carry the mile pack, right? I'm guessing. But he's like, go two. Go two miles. Again, not a new legalism. It's, it's love. They're supposed to be marked by difference. First Peter 2, 22 through 24. This is about Jesus. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. But when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. We're a different kind of people because we've been loved generously. I really do think if you contemplate God's love for you and his grace for you, that your patience for people increases. And very rarely are we thinking about his grace when we get outraged. Maybe never. Service and audacity is the third one. Fourth, generosity for needy. Look at verse uh, 42 now. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. The, the idea here is that you're to, to help those who are truly in need, actually. So you literally are generous with those who are actually needy. Now, I think it, I, I, any of these things done legalistically without considering the fullness of Scripture can make you do silly things, or at least not helpful things. An example would be like giving to someone, I don't know, who is actively going to purchase drugs, and we know for a fact, right? So not every situation is like that, but you, you've not helped them, right? And they might not be needy. In fact, they might need to do something else. So we're not called to just be silly about these things. In fact, think about 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. Uh, Paul talks about this. He says, for even uh, when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now, that's not Paul saying, do whatever you want and just ask. The church will fix it. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that we have a, a role as faithful humanity to actually work. So we're not called to enable laziness. That's not what he's called us to do. But most definitely, he's called us to be generous with people who actually have real needs. That the people of God aren't comfortable with going, eh, sorry. There's a certain love that is natural to us to be generous. And we're called to be generous with people who have real needs. Generous. So generosity for the needy. Uh, the next two, I'll do at once, are, are love for enemies and prayer for persecution. Now these, I think, are, are not as again, natural to us. Look at verses 43 uh, through 44, 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbors and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. 
So again, one more time he does this. Jesus speaks with authority. And he is, he is declaring as kind of the new Moses for his new people, all right, a redeemed people who've been forgiven or being changed by the gospel. He's called us to, to much more than just getting by in bare minimums. He calls, look what it says. You've heard it said, you, you, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now the Old Testament says nothing about hating your enemy like this. But it was just common tradition. You are called to love your neighbor. Great, I understand that, but you might as well hate your, your enemy. And if you think about it, we tend to probably affirm that in our flesh. We tend to be like, yeah, enemy, you can, you can hate them. That's fine. And that is not what Jesus says. He says, but I say to you, the king, speaking to his people and now you, that you're to love your enemies. Now, it doesn't say people who are inconvenient for you. It says you're called to love enemies. Enemies aren't so passive. Enemies aren't indifferent. They're intentional. Enemies don't like you. And yet, that's exactly what the king has said his people to be like. Love for enemies. Jesus, again, once more exposes the bent use of the law. People knew love your neighbor, kind of. He's saying love your enemies. I say to you, love your enemies. Love is not what gets you into the kingdom, but love is what you will show if you're already part of it. Let me say that again. Love is not what gets you into the kingdom, but love is what will show if you are already part of it. Love is natural to the people of God walking in the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit. What's the first one? Right. Love. Correct. Correct for everyone who answered that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Love is the first thing it said. It's natural to the Spirit of God to love. That's just who He is. And when He's reigning in your life, loving even for enemies, even if it's difficult, it's kind of normal for the Spirit of God. It's a family resemblance. Look what it says. Pray those who persecute you so that you may be sons, your, uh, sons of your Father who is in heaven. So the next thing it says, though, is, is to pray. Pray for your enemies. So it's not just that you, you love them. Pray for those who persecute you. Again, persecution is not a, a, an accident, right? Persecution is on purpose. I'm meant to do it. And what we want to do in our flesh is to, to be outraged and to pray like the Davidic Psalms, <laughs> like crush him, destroy him. <laughs> like that, those are our prayers, you know. And yet you could pray, God opened his eyes, open her eyes. God, help them to see the gospel. Help them to see that they are in need of a Savior. This is counter our flesh, but exactly what he's called his people to be. It's in view of who God is. It's in view of who God is that he calls us to do this. Love sets you free in a weird way. Because if, if, you're, if you don't have to respond, if you don't have to defend your reputation and have to defend your honor when offended, you're more free than the person that has to. Because you've entrusted this to God. He continues, again, family resemblance is the idea. Love, the, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And why does he say this? So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. Have you ever heard how some people talk about God who hate him? All these cheap shots, sky fairy, you know, wrathful, vengeful, all this kind of junk. That's the short list. The list is huge. And yet, God will actively send sunshine. Those same people will go outside and enjoy the sky today. He sends rain that allows the ground to grow things. Uh, this is who he is. He is kind and generous to people who don't deserve it, people who actually hate him. And it's in view of that, he says, look, be like your, your father. It's a family resemblance. He makes the sun rise on evil, and you're called to do the same. People who don't deserve it, the father has been kind to them still. Now, he's just, this does not, I think what kind of makes us not want to do this is we feel like we're forfeiting justice, and you don't have to worry about that. God is fully just. Everyone will give an account. But we're called to, to love like him, to love for enemies, and actually pray for persecutors, that God would open their eyes at least. It continues, 46 through 47. And then he, he, he raises it again. 
For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Jesus to his people. Jesus to us. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Think about this. Our tax collectors are not like highly regarded. <laughs> okay. They're viewed as, as, as dirtbags. And, and he's saying, look, those kind of people, gangsters, mafia, they're kind to their family, mostly. <laughs> you know, obviously, we know that there are real exceptions to the rule, I'm assuming. I'm telling you, Hitler was probably nice to his, his, some, some of his family, you know? So the point is, like, you're not being any different than that if you can love people who, who you already like. What's the deal? That's what he says. If, you, if tax collectors, they love one another. But then I'd never noticed this before. Look at verse 47. If you greet only your brothers. Never noticed that before. Because I'm usually hit by the enemies and praying for the persecuted. But it says, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Even Gentiles do the same. All right? If certain people are carefully ignored and only those close to us receive our sincere good wishes, how do we differ from pagans? Do you hear that? It's too easy to like people who you already like. And the people of God are called to love people you, you don't naturally like. This is the king's people. They're a different kind of people. And it's in view of the Father who has already loved us. Do you understand? This is hard-hitting stuff if you actually live it. You're like, oh, that's cool. I'll really work on that next time someone cuts me off in the grocery store. And that's not what's going on here. Pray for people who persecute you. He's already told them in the context the persecution's coming. Love your enemies is what he's saying to do. So this is, we're known for love. Love your enemies, pray for persecutors. Last verse, look at verse 48. You therefore must be perfect. As your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if you read that word perfect, your first move is to just fold, right? Well, I'm out. (laughs) I I really do think the faithful understanding of this is is complete. It means to be mature. Um, in the context, we're called to, to mature uh, universal love. That God has loved people who are not worthy of it. And he's called us to, to cultivate and to become mature loving people. You're called to love people who are your enemies. That's a different kind of maturity. You're called to pray for people who persecute you. That's a different kind of maturity. But it's a mark of love. There's a story. What about us? I'll just leave it with this. There's a guy who, who wrote a story that I think is really helpful. As you think about, these are just marks of just unexpected family features. We've already talked about this. But he also, I think Jesus is also showing us the very first Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, and, which means that you are spiritually low. And when you look at these passages and we see what God has called us to, the, the bar is kind of high. It's really high. I think this is helpful. Uh, he, this guy tells the story of what he calls a clean-cut kid, an 18-year-old. He writes this, One reason Jesus chose to comment on these six particular Old Testament commands was to allow the richness of God's Word to make us poor in spirit. When you actually sit under this stuff and you think, I'm called to love, not tolerate, you see that's not the same. To love an enemy. And actually pray for someone who's actively trying to ruin my life. It's a different kind of thing. It makes you poor in spirit. Uh, to allow the holy heaviness of the law to make us wholly humble before God. When you think of actually living this, you kind of brought low. He says this, picture a clean-cut kid, which means good, you know, well-put-together person. He's 18. He gets good grades. He obeys his parents. He loves his brothers and sisters. He visits grandma from time to time. He doesn't party, doesn't stay out late, doesn't fool around with the girls, and he goes to church each week, even prays, each night before he goes to bed. This is a good kid. This is the boy most parents want their daughter to bring home someday. With his handling of the law, listen, Jesus tells this good kid to sit down and hold out his hands. Everyone hold out your hands just for a second, then you can put them back. All right, that's fine. Um, Hold out his hands. I've lost it because I had to do that. Uh, Hold out your hands. 
Uh, and the Lord proceeds to place the heavy command and the heavy command upon this young man. Here's, the, here's how it goes. Jesus asks him, have you murdered somebody? No, sir, of course not. Uh, Jesus, what I mean is, have you ever lost your temper? Have you ever let a careless, biting, hurtful word fly from your mouth like, you blockhead, you foolish idiot? Yes, sir. All right, here's a 200-pound weight. Hold this in your right hand. Are you ready for the next question? Here it is. Have you ever committed adultery? No, sir, I'm not even married. Uh, oh, no? My question was not, has nothing to do with your marriage. Let me put it this way. Have you ever thought an impure thought about any girl? Yes, sir. Of course, sir. Ah, I thought so. Well, here you go. Another 200-pound weight. Put this in your left hand. At this point, Jesus looks at this poor soul and noticing his discomfort says, shall I go on? The young man answers, no, sir, please stop. I get the point. Jesus replies, but I haven't gotten to the 500-pound question, the one I plan to place in your head. Don't you want to hear my perfect love question? Have you loved everybody, even your enemies at all times? No, sir. I'm done, sir. I get the point. He gets the point. Do you get the point? What's the point? We don't feel the weight of God's glory, the heaviness of his holiness. One of our favorite question, question gives the game away. We love to ask, listen, how could a good and loving God send anyone to hell? How could a good and loving God send anyone to hell? Why doesn't anyone ask, how can a good and holy God bring anyone to heaven? Here in Matthew 5, Jesus explains the full and rich implications of God's perfect law so that we might embrace poverty of spirit, recognizing our unrighteousness and thus our need for God's perfect righteousness. He teaches to his people. And the raining day was kind of a surface performance. Like Pastor J.C. said, the heart is the issue. Just because you do the thing doesn't mean your heart even agrees. So the heart is the issue. He's looking for hearts that are transformed. And when he shares this stuff, it kind of crushes you. Poor in spirit. That you know full well you're not like God in that way. And in fact, that he needs to change you if you're going to be like him. That's what this passage is about. We're called to love like our king. Jesus was generous. He was love incarnate. He gave his life, not just his wealth. He was slapped. His beard was torn. He did no evil in response. He loved his enemies. He actually prayed for those who persecuted him. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Judas, at the Lord's Supper, was fed. He had a meal that day. Jesus knew full well what he was about to do. And the Bible says in Romans 5a that God demonstrates his own love. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we are enemies by nature and by choice. That we do things on purpose. And God in his goodness and his grace has loved us. That's what this passage is about. That we're called to be different. He has given us grace when we didn't deserve it. The burden of this trying to live it legalistically will crush you. And yet, and yet, we're called to be like him. I really do think he's called us to love actual enemies to pray for people who actually persecute us, to care for the needy, to give grace when we're offended, to serve people when they've asked for offensive things, to exceed that. It's all rooted in love. Love like our king. That's really what he's called you to. Think on this. My prayer is that God will open your eyes to show you what needs to change. First, that if you don't know him, Christ came for us. Like none of us, none of us qualify. Poor in spirit is step one. Let's pray. Father, um, I pray that you would mature us uh, today as we think of your call to, to meekness. When we're offended, that is, we want to re return fire. We want to be offensive. When we're asked to do, uh, when someone takes advantage or we, we're called to give something, we, we want to do the bare minimum. And you've called us to exceed that, to do it in love. Uh, when People called us to do things that are inconvenient, services. You've actually said to exceed them. You've called us to be generous with those who have needs, to love, actually, enemies, like you did first, and to pray for people who persecuted us. And, and it's all rooted in who he is, that you give grace to, to your enemies. You love them. You're kind to them. 
Father, I don't know what needs to be done, but I pray that you today would conform us to the image and likeness of Christ. As we fought on today, the sufficiency of the cross, uh, the reality that we, we don't deserve grace, you've made a way for, for enemies to become family. So, Lord God, will you help us as your people to reflect the family values, that love would be something we're known for. I pray that, that as a church and as individuals of the church, that love would be uh, one of our defining characteristics and for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name.